Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the invitation to this wonderful event. Uh, I'm here to talk about transformational change and uh, change towards a sustainable future or maybe towards the restart of Greece. And of course, this will take leadership on all levels, political leaders, corporate leaders, project leaders, but also leadership exercised and practiced by us all as consumers, as parents or as citizens. And I'd like to start my presentation with a question. Uh, I think we all of us have to ask ourselves, how can we become agents of large-scale transformation and change? And just being more than anxious critics of the present or wishful thinkers about the better future or doing just the wrong things right there. Uh, transformation of organizations and institutions is about creating human energy. And uh, such human energy is created, I think, when we invite people to something that is meaningful, something that is learningful, something that is worth the people's full commitment. How does that happen? Well, in my experience, in my leadership journey, I think that happens when we invite people into projects and missions that are relevant to our times. When we invite people to co-create, when we invite people to see things from outside looking in and just like the inside out perspective. And of course, we are living in times of profound change. We all know that. And I'd like to start with a quote from Václav Havel, who said some years ago that I think the reason to suggest that the modern age, the industrial era as we know it, has ended. Today we are going through a transitional period when something is on the way out and something else is painfully trying to be born. Something old is crumbling, decaying, and exhausting itself, while something else, still indistinct, were arising from the rubble. I think that's a much more poetic way of describing the new paradigm or the post-industrial or whatever you like to call it. And of course, the old that is decaying, it's the mechanical industrial worldview. The idea that we make our machines and we go to the moon and we come back and we think we, humanity, are in control. We are in charge of other people, of nature. Of course, that was an illusion. And the new that is painfully trying to be born is a world that is much more borderless, much more global, digital, and I would say brutal in many ways. And it's extremely interconnected to a radically new complexity. And seeing the new world, that is really to see with new eyes. Because remember, we really don't see the world as the world is. We see the world as we are. And an extremely important point, I think, in leadership. And also remember that when we talk about the future, the future is not a road that has to be discovered or predicted. The future is a road that still has to be created. And that itself is an important part in any leadership agenda. And good leadership then, I think, is taking an organizing principle, not with a question, what is good for our company, but the question, what is our company good for? Or what is our country good for? Or what is our city good for? Taking an outside-in perspective. What are the today's leadership challenges? Well, I want to present two. How to create a sustainable future or how to create organizational change. Two issues that I have close to my heart. And I think since we took this picture from space, we have started to realize that we are on a spaceship. And this spaceship is surrounded with a very, very, very thin layer of atmosphere that makes life possible. And it's limited resources on this spaceship. And only 100 years ago we were 2 billion people, now we are almost 7 billion people in 100 years. So we have to rethink. We have to do more with less. We have to rethink the way we do things generally. And it's good to bring back the old Einstein quote that all of you have seen, that we need a new way of thinking to solve the problems caused by the old way of thinking. And what is that new way of thinking? Well, I think it's easy to find the source of inspiration for that new way of thinking. We find it in nature itself. Because nature as a system is a wonderful system. The word waste hasn't been invented. It's a truly circular system. Everything that is output in one living process is input to another living process. But the industrial system we have been for 150 years, it's a linear system. It's take, make, and waste. And we have get out of that linear thinking and back to circular thinking. 
we have to go from conquering nature to living in harmony with nature. Because we have to remind ourselves that the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the ecology, not the other way around. And the new thinking also has to be about how we measure development, how we measure our progress. When I was young back in the late 60s and early 70s, we already then was talking about the fact that GDP is a lousy measure. And you see Robert Kennedy, 68, said GDP measures everything besides what makes lives worth living. <laughs> and still we have this measure as the dominated uh, paradigm. But now you know Nicolas Sarkozy, the president of France, he needs something else, so he's produced a happiness index or a well-being index. So these are things that we, we will see come. I'd like to share a few examples, some leadership examples, going from intentions to actions. And I will start with a rather controversial corporation called Walmart. You might heard about it. It's one of the biggest we have. And this guy, Lee Scott, the CEO, he gathered 250 of his top managers in October 2006. And he said, I just had, had, had a wake-up call. I was down in Katrina and the New Orleans terrible flooding. And it's obvious that this is an environmental problem in slow motion we'll see. It's obvious that there's not two worlds out there, one Walmart world and another world. We breathe the same air. And it's obvious we as a company have to completely rethink how we do in relation to environmental challenges. So from now on, these are the goals for us in this company. 100% renewable energy, create zero waste, and sell products that sustain the environment. And he continued by saying, and of course remember, we will not be measured by our aspirations. We will be measured by our actions. So then, of course, he went on, like a good American CEO, to present his three-year targets, his seven-year targets, his ten-year targets. And I kind of like this in the sense that here you have a big company setting out a new course. And when the new truck manufacturers are asked, how more efficient are your trucks three, five years from now? There's only one answer that is valid, at least 30, 40 percent because the biggest transport buyer in the world had decided to improve transport efficiency with 30-40%. And another interesting aspect is you set out a course, a commitment, not knowing exactly how to get there. And you know what happens? All experts in the world come running with solutions to provide possible ways to address this. So there are a lot of dynamics coming out of an, a commitment like this. Another example from intentions to actions is China. Since 2007, they have a mantra or a vision of a circular economy in social harmony. And when we from West come to visit them, they think that you talk a lot, but we don't see much action. We hear a lot of thunder from you guys, but we see no rain. We have to go into action. And really, action is coming. This is their plan for 2020 in terms of, of, of low carbon energy. They're going to double hydro. They're going to go for wind, enormous capacity, photovoltaic, biomass solar heating, nuclear, and they have big subsidies and maybe a carbon tax to support this. This is massive expansions. It took them two years to produce more solar heating equipment than the rest of the world together. And the next five-year plan that is coming in China, it was just presented a couple of weeks ago, an enormous amount of money behind, so say, support of this plan. What about the United States? Well, also here, massive investments. But, of course, these are done through Silicon Valley, through venture capital, through entrepreneurship. And it's pro-science, pro-technology, pro-business, pro-risk. And it's also supported by a lot of state subsidies. So here we see green and clean technology. It's really a battle now for millions of jobs and trillions of dollars. The Americans do it their way, and China is doing it their way. And the, what we can learn from this, of course, is there's a race right now for innovations for new products, new processes, business model, education, a new way of thinking. And we're just in the beginning of this race. And as far as I'm concerned, I think that sustainability today then is more than an ethical imperative. It is becoming a decisive business imperative. Because I think it's easy to say that countries, regions, cities, or companies that don't really see this challenge they will be left behind. Very often the question is, what about, is there money around for this? Well, it looks like it. If you take a look at this chick picture, 
This is the sum of the money spent in the United States for the Marshall Plan, for the moonshot, for the Korean War, for the Vietnam War, for the New Deal, for the Gulf War. Add all this money together and make it into present value of the money today. And you sum it up, and it's the same amount that went into bailing out the banks. So somehow there seems to be money around. So what's the problem? Well, I think we are sitting in a dilemma. Because in spite of all this good initiative, we are still going in the wrong direction when it comes to uh, taking care of, of, of the ecological system. The greenhouse gas emissions are still rising day by day. And this dilemma, I think, can be illustrated by a quote from President Clinton, when he said, I was struck by the countries that won't meet their Kyoto targets. Remember, 170 signed the Kyoto deal, only 10 will, will be able to deliver on those targets. They aren't lazy, they aren't stupid, and not corrupt. They are well-meaning, hard-working people who, like all political leaders, are facing all kinds of competing pressures in an economy that is not organized for tomorrow's energy. It's organized for yesterday's. And you see, even there, when we start to see the need for do this, and we go out to try to do it, we are stuck in a present system. And I think that is a dilemma, and we have to be honest about that. And that leads me to my second leadership challenge how to create transformational change, how to create organizational change. And I think we have a bigger problem. What if it's not an environmental problem you talk about? We have problems with schools, with healthcare system. What if we have organizations and institutions today that are not capable, really, to deal with the complexities that we are living in today? What if organizations really don't act like machines, but they act like living communities? And I think this mechanical worldview has almost also taken us in to see our organizations as if they were machines. Department, 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 people sitting up there in power, taking decisions, and believing that things are going to happen down there, what they want to happen. That's not the case. I can get invited to give speeches around the world on how do we drive change, how do we drive innovation. But it's interesting, we drive cars and we drive machines, but have you tried to drive your teenagers? Have you tried to make a plan to change your wife or your husband? Well, we tend to laugh at that because we know it's not possible. But when we get into our institutions, we're going to drive change. We're going to drive innovation. We're going to change the corporate culture. Change the culture as if it was a spare part. No, if we understand it's about the living community, we might ask the question, how can we grow a different culture? And growing a different culture is very different from changing. I think we need more biological metaphors. Once I was told that, and of course we know it, it takes nine months to deliver a baby, independent how many people you put on the project. <laughs> That's a biological metaphor. That's a biological metaphor that takes us, some things takes time. And learning takes time. Building trust takes time. I think this is an extremely important leadership challenge for us. So what if less is less about reorganizing and restructuring and more about reconceiving? Yes, exactly. Leadership is about reconceiving, helping people to see something different, helping people to see a new world with new eyes. Because what if people don't mind change, but they mind being changed? It's true for me, and it's probably true for you. As I said initially, people are not led by managers. They are led by good ideas. Ideas that are relevant to our times, that are inspirational, that are meaningful, and that is, are worth really people's full commitment. I tend to get the question very often, am I an optimist or a pessimist? Well, I have to say, intellectually, I think we have to uh, be allowed to be pessimistic when we see all the challenges in front of us, and we see all the self-interest, well-organized, that is resisting change. But of course, in our daily work, we have to stay hopeful. And when I have to personally refill my hope, I go back to the first industrial revolution. That was a transforming of our society. And remember, there was no master plan, there was no starting point, no, nobody leading it, there was no organization in charge. That whole transformation of society at that time happened through a million of small beginnings, a process of making things better, an outpouring of human creativity. It was changing perceptions among the many people. And isn't that hopeful? We can all be part of those small million beginnings. 
However, we know that transformational change takes a desirable dream of the future. And I think a sustainable future has to be seen as something desirable. Remember Martin Luther King. He said, I have a dream. He did not say, I have a nightmare. <laughs> and he had said that because he definitely had a nightmare. We know that. But that wouldn't have created a lot of energy. That wouldn't have been very meaningful. So that brings me back to Václav Havel again. In a letter from prison, he wrote to his wife saying, optimism is an expectation based on the evidence at hand that there are reasonable likelihood of a positive outcome. A beautiful definition of what positivism is. But he went on by saying, hope, my friend, is something very different. It's the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it might turn out. And you see, we have to stay hopeful. Without hope, we vanish. And that takes me back to my first question. How can we, once again, sort of say, frame the question as, how can we become agents, all of us, in a million small beginnings for transformation and change, being more just critics of the present, present or wishful thinkers of the future, or doing the wrong things right? So in conclusion, starting from scratch, how to be, what it, what it has to be, so say, to create a desirable future. It has to be about creating a desirable future. And remember, the future has still to be created, not predicted. And it has to be co-created by liberating human creativity, by, by inviting people to meaningful cause to believe in. We have to create a transformational change towards a sustainable future by a million of small beginnings where we all can play a role. That is the leadership challenge of our time. I think for you here, but also for all of us in the global family. And what can be mean, more meaningful than that? Thanks for your attention. <laughs>